Rings, The Rings of Power, Season 2, Episode 5, Reaction and Breakdown. Storylines appearing in this episode are Aregion, Kazadun, Numenor, as well as some moments in Linden and the woods outside of Aregion where elves and orcs are preparing for battle. This episode, we were given a much appreciated break from the deserts of Rune and the mud of Pelargir. So let's recap this episode, beginning with what might be the strongest plotline of season two, Khazad Dun. In the first moments of this episode, there's this gorgeous transition between a shot of the Misty Mountains and the gem on one of the Dwarven Rings. We then see that they have been delivered to Khazad Dun, and now Durin III stands before them. The rings seem to be whispering to Durin as he picks up a ring and places it on his finger. We then find ourselves in the mines where the dwarves are digging new shafts in order to reach the sunlight. Durin III is guided by his ring, and he says to his son, all is shortly to be well. He's definitely acting very weird almost immediately after putting on the ring. But because of the ring, he is able to see the mountain, and he points out where to dig, and then soon the sunlight is restored to Moria. Peter Mullen, who plays Durin the Third, brings the standout performance of this episode, which I think is high praise because, honestly, this episode is one of the best of the whole series so far, and King Durin's dialogue is so well written and delivered. As this ring provides the answers to their problems, Soon, a change in the king's behavior is noticed by his son, who then seeks counsel from Celebrimbor concerning the rings. The king gathers emissaries of the seven dwarven realms to introduce the rings, which he says he is not going to give freely, but he rather demands tribute for them. He also forsakes his old wisdom and directs the miners to delve deeper, so I, you know, I can only assume they're going to delve too greedily and too deep. King Dorin also has a moment where he has taken off his ring, and he accuses Narvi of stealing it. And Narvi replies with what I thought was a very interesting line. He says, You took it off. You said your arm was feeling heavy. In a slightly comical scene, Disa discovers a hidden cavern where it would seem that she hears the mountain groaning or perhaps growling. Clearly, I think she's about to discover the Balrog. Durin IV continually warns his father about the ring, but his pleas fall onto deaf ears. Disa makes Durin swear that he will never wear one of the rings, so there is trouble brewing in Khazad Dun. Meanwhile, it's not going so great in Eregion either. In Eregion, the forging of the Seven has been completed, and the doors of Durin have been made disappointingly off screen. I was a little bit bummed out that we didn't get to see any of the process for these, but I get it. We only have so much time. We better not waste that time on any more Harfoots hugging, though. The relationship between Anatar and Celebrimbor has been described as domestic in the press leading up to this season, and I think it was in this episode where we finally begin to see that coming into play. They are bickering nonstop. Anatar seems jealous, almost, of the friendship between Celebrimbor and Narvi, and the two are bickering almost constantly, and there's a lot of tension clearly beneath the surface. After the seven have been forged, Celebrimbor is ready to close up shop, but Anatar is not satisfied with the forging of the seven, and now he insists that more rings must be made, and these rings should be given to the race of men. In this conversation that they have, Anatar makes enough references to the Silmarillion to make me forget pretty much any issue I may have ever had with the series in terms of the lore. He names drop Arendil, Tuor, and Baron all in one sentence. Eventually, Celebrimbor refuses to make rings for men, so then Anatar is kind of a brat and he's like, fine, I'll do it myself. And he storms off. Like, okay. There are also several hints towards where the series may take Sauron's character in the coming seasons, and I loved this part. So Anatar is pleading with Celebrimbor on behalf of men, claiming that the men are the ones who suffer most under the reign of Mordor. I'm hoping that they're doing this to sort of begin setting him up as Sauron, the lord of men, who is later going to challenge Farazone's authority. He also has some very, very lovely, interesting dialogue about Numenor, 
which was great characterization for Sauron. He says, I fear Numenor more than any land in Middle-earth. And it's so true, he does. In what I've found to be the most interesting original subplot of this episode, we see that Anatar has taken a shine to Celebrimbor's apprentice Myrdania, who just so happens to bear a striking resemblance to Galadriel. In a really ridiculous scene in which it appears that the forge is haunted, um, the first 15 seconds of the scene I was rolling my eyes and about to die um, from cringe. But then we learn that it's actually Merdania because she was testing one of the new rings and she has unwittingly entered into the unseen world. So she comes back out of it. And despite the initial silliness of this scene, I think Merdania's description of her experience in the unseen world really redeems this moment as she begins to describe what and who she has seen. If you go back and rewatch this episode, you have to look at Anatar as he's listening to her because he must be thinking about how she's really perceived him and the horror that she feels at having perceived him must be rough. So she says, I was in a place like this, but shrouded in mist and darkness. And I saw, at first I thought it was the forge burning, but it wasn't. It was tall and its skin was made of flames. It came toward me, breathing, reeking of death, and I saw its eyes, pitiless and eternal. And then we get the line from one of the trailers where she says, I think it's been here. I think it's been here among us all along. After this frightening experience, Anatar conveniently finds the time to console Myrdania. He then tells her that the terrifying figure she saw is actually Celebrimbor in his unseen world form saying that his spirit is diminished and he's vulnerable to the shadow. So here we get the seeds of Anatar kind of trying to put a wedge between the smiths of Eregion and Celebrimbor. Then there's this great moment that all the shippers are going to love where, where Anatar is like, oh my gosh, in this light you look just like the Lady Galadriel. And then he touches her hair, which, oh my goodness gracious. He says, when the light caught your hair, for a moment you seemed her perfect likeness. And Marjania is like, who? Whose likeness? What are you even talking about? And he's like, why, Lady Galadriel, of course. Like, obviously, who else would it be? So that was a great moment. I, uh, you know, we live off of crumbs, and that was a good crumb. The seeds of doubt and deception. Durin the Younger arrives in Eregion to take counsel with Celebrimbor about how his father is being affected by the ring which I think plants some seeds of doubt in Celebrimbor's mind. Durin says, how much do you really know about this Anatar? Celebrimbor really doesn't know much about him, to be honest. Later, Celebrimbor brings this matter to Anatar, who reveals that the rings actually might be tainted, but it's not his fault. It's clearly Celebrimbor's fault, because he lied in his letter to Gilgalad. Anatar presents him with what I might call an ultimatum, he says, either we need to confess to Gilgalad and stop forging altogether, or we could make more rings to somehow redeem ourselves. Something I'm finding very interesting is that the way Anatar is manipulating Celebrimbor doesn't really make a lot of sense. But when you're in a relationship of this nature, things don't have to make sense for them to work. Celebrimbor initially refuses to make more rings, but he at last concedes, and then he starts to become harsh with the smiths under his direction. We see this sad moment where Celebrimbor freaks out and he's yelling at all of the smiths. They're sad. Everyone's sad. And then Celebrimbor goes off to his desk where he's shaking and he looks really overwhelmed. Like he looks like he's having not a full-blown panic attack, but maybe we're getting there. And then Anatar uses that moment to be like, don't worry, besties, I got you. Like, just put your faith in old Anatar, your buddy. Next up, let's talk about Numenor, the rise of the Kingsmen. We finally return to Numenor in this episode to see that Farazone has taken the scepter, and he's speaking to his son Kemet about Erisea. He's jealous of the elves, and, and he resents them for their gift of immortality and bliss. Farazone tells his son of a prophecy where his mother somehow foresaw that he would come to ill ends, and then he threatens him, so he's not winning dad of the year. 
We also see that the Palantir has been taken away and locked up, but Farazone the hypocrite approaches it with the intention of using it. Meanwhile, in the tower, there is a moment shared between Elendil where he consoles Muriel, assuring her that the Sea Guard still remains loyal to her and encouraging her to fight back against Farazone. Instead, Muriel commands Elendil to remain calm, and, and unfortunately, he's not very good at that. The persecution of the faithful in Numenor begins to move at a faster pace. First, the members of the Sea Guard who remain loyal to Muriel are stripped of their rank. Elendil sees this going down and he joins them in resigning, which provokes more loyalty from the soldiers, and it really makes Kemen mad. He says, how do you think this ends? Which, um, that's kind of an unsettling thought. Aarian at this point has fully turned her back on her father, but from her perspective, she believes it's her father who has turned his back on her. So she's really going through a rough time. Her mother's dead. Her brother is gone. She thinks her other brother is dead. So, you know, not good times for Aarian. Later, a ritual of the faithful is being performed for their dead, where they release these cute little candles into the water and ask the Valar for prayers. I'm assuming that these prayers are specifically going to Nienna because of the appearance of this relic of a weeping woman. The ritual is then broken up, and the faithful are forced to abandon the area, and then Kemen, being that jerk that he is, smashes the relic. A big fight breaks out, during which Kemen attempts to drown Volandil, and then ultimately kills him by stabbing him in the back. Elendil is then blamed for the violence and arrested. This scene was brutal. I did not expect Volandil to die so soon. I was really hoping he would be here for the long haul because he was such a good embodiment of the faithful and kind of an ally to Elendil, but it's almost as if Elendil is going to become even more isolated as the story goes on. The last sort of plot line that we'll talk about in this episode is the elves and orcs preparing for battle. We spend a few moments in Linden this episode where Gilgalad is reading the letter from Celebrimbor and then later is being advised to march against Adar instead of worry about Aregion. The ring gives him a vision in which he sees a couple things. There's like a storm with rocks and dust, maybe an explosion, a bunch of fish laying in dry land, Sauron in his full armor walking through some flames, and then he sees some orcs that are all like bloody and gunky. Elrond arrives in Linden and tries to warn Gilgalad, but his counsel is not heeded. It's also in this episode where we get to see Elrond running through the woods and he like lets go of his cloak and it like flies back in the wind and it looks super cool. So Elrond is just looking great this season. In the forest surrounding Aragion, the orcs are gathering near and building their orc camps as orcs do. And Galadriel arrives at this camp in a cage but is released and then taken by Adar, who is like, girl, stop trying to kill me. We have a common enemy and I want to make a plan. Episode five thoughts. This was definitely the best episode of the season so far, which is much appreciated after episode four, which I didn't really enjoy that much. Halfway through this episode, I wrote down in my notes, this episode is so good. I'm scared it's going to end soon. And then it was wonderful because it just kept going. It was a really, really good episode. There were so many little nods to the Silmarillion, especially as we got Baron, Tour, and Arendel name drops. Like, gosh, I loved that. Uh, my little nerd heart was so happy. I also really appreciated being able to focus on Aregion and Casa Doom, which are two of the strongest storylines in this series. Returning to Numenor was also really enjoyable, despite how painful the story is. The death of Volandil was just like, came out of nowhere. It was so unnecessary. You guys did not need to hurt me like this. But I kind of imagine it's only a taste of what is to come for the faithful. Elendil's vision in the Palantir was also a great moment. It was one of those moments that, even though it felt like a pretty obvious callback to the Jackson films where Arwen sees this vision of Aragorn in the future, somehow it still really worked. It was a very haunting moment with great foreshadowing. I was really disappointed that the Dwarven Rings and the Doors of Durin were made off screen. We didn't even get to see the Doors of Durin lit up and the Siege of Eregion is already happening. So ugh, we better get those soon. I Like, what are they going to be up for five minutes and then they're shut forever? Is anyone even going to be able to use them? 
Another highlight of this episode was the music. I was texting my friends while watching, like, the Casa Doom theme, it just goes so hard, and it's so good. Bear McCreary's score really elevates the show in so many ways, and it, like, it complements these little moments, and he's just a genius. I'm so thankful that we have Bear working on this show. I hope we never lose him. In Aragion, we can see that Celebrimbor is beginning to break, which is really tragic. And we know even just from trailers, like it's going to get so much worse for this poor guy. I'm very afraid of how hard the rest of the season will be for me to watch as someone who really loves Celebrimbor. I feel like after episode four, I was kind of feeling like maybe we are so over. And I'm thinking after episode five, I think we are so back. I will see you all next week for episode six. Let me know what you thought of episode five. Do you think it was an improvement? Do you feel like now that we're getting moving with a lot of things, like, are you enjoying it more or less? Um, Yeah, just I'd love to hear your thoughts.